Welcome to my presentation, Designing for Diversity, Five Ways to Create a More Inclusive Online Course. My name is Anna Rodriguez. I'm a Faculty Development Officer at the, at the Teaching and Learning Center at Ontario Tech University. I have a PhD in education from York University. And my background, I worked in television news for about 10 years, and I've been teaching at post-secondary institutions for the past 15 years. So what is designing for diversity, you may ask? Well, it's considering the full range of diversity found in your classrooms. So um, factors that you may want to consider in terms of your students' backgrounds is um, their ability, gender, culture, socioeconomic status, geographical location, their age, ethnicity, cultural traditions, and so on. This list is not exhaustive. And as well, these factors also intersect. So what you want to do is keep in mind how these, fact, uh, these factors and then how they intersect when you're thinking about designing a course. And so then your next question may be, why design for diversity? Well, it becomes a way to include everyone in the classroom. And you're ensuring as well that everyone in the classroom is having learning experiences that are equitable. And so you may say to yourself, well, I provide the same lessons to everyone. I, I provide the same content, the same articles, the same books. But um, as I just had um, talked about in the, in the past slide, everyone comes into your classroom with uh, different experiences, different backgrounds, and some of these backgrounds as well intersect. And all of that will impact the way that they learn in your classroom. So you may be providing everyone with the same thing, but when the student is actually experiencing learning in your classroom, they're going to experience it different, differently from other students. And then as well, um, it's actually the right thing to do. As an educator, you wanna make sure that everyone is included in your classroom. So it's the human thing to do to design for diversity. So when I'm thinking about designing for diversity, I use culturally responsive teaching as a framework to guide me as I'm, I'm working in that area. So um, culturally responsive teaching um, comes from a work that Gloria Latson Billings did in 1995. She's an academic. And um, what she did was she started to write about how it's very important to understand this range of diversity in your classroom. So the backgrounds and the experiences that your students are bringing into the classroom, because it really, really impacts the way they're going to learn. And she also talks about how it's so important to create safe spaces uh, where students feel that they belong and are valued, where they feel that their backgrounds are really um, are really are welcomed, and um, that they are someone that is valuable in terms of of the course and learning with other students. And so she said that um, as well. It's very important for educators to not only understand and acknowledge diversity, but also appreciate um, the different uh, abilities, the different uh, cultural traditions, the different ethnicities, the different backgrounds that are that students bring into the classroom. So that means going beyond just understanding about diversity and um, taking a step to appreciating values and attitudes that are different from your own. So we can bring culturally, culturally responsive teaching into online course design as well. And that's what this presentation is about. It's looking at five different ways that you can make very small changes in your course design. So the first tip that I have to share is looking at um, student introductions and figuring out how you can learn a little bit more from your students um, through different activities. Um, typ typically, student introductions tend to be a bit um, uh, this done in the same way where we ask students, you know, why are you taking this course? What sort of experiences do you have in this sort of area? What are your interests, perhaps hobbies? But sometimes we don't really know a lot about students. Um, and in online learning and teaching, that is so much more important um, to maybe understand where your student is located in the world because they may be located anywhere in the world. Um, and that can affect the way they're learning in your classroom and perhaps maybe figure out if they're in a rural area versus a city because that could affect their internet um, connectivity, their access to reliable internet. So an easy course activity um, uh, that you can do as a student introduction or just as an activity um, in an asynchronous or synchronous course is to create a Padlet with a world map and there's a template um, at padlet.com where you can do this and ask 
students where they're located um, by placing a pin on a map. So I'm just going to go quickly to one that I've set up that you can go to then yourself if you'd like to add a pin. And all you have to do is click on this plus sign. I'm actually near Peterborough, so Peterborough, Ontario. So I'm going to place a pin there. And as you can see, it's now placed my pin. It gives you an option to provide, you know, to, um, to add a picture or a link. And so it's up to you if you want students to do that. But in terms of uh, keeping in mind the privacy, um, and some students may want to keep private where they're actually located, you can just ask them to share where they are in the world. And then once all the students have placed their pins, you can bring this map into the classroom and have a conversation about um, what we're seeing and what you're seeing in terms of uh, where people are located. And people maybe might want to volunteer, students may want to volunteer um, a little bit more about where they're, they're living. But the other thing is you get to learn um, you know, you get to learn if you have any students that are living in different time zones and how that may affect the way that they access materials in your course or how they can access um, or attend presentations if it's a synchronous course. As well, you may learn if a student is in a rural area and may have challenges with reliable internet. So it becomes an easy way to learn a little bit more about your students um, and uh, start a little bit, uh, start a conversation about where they live and a little bit about their uh, location um, in terms of where they are living in the world. Tip number two is creating a welcoming course landing page. So we look at course uh, landing pages um, as places to add lots of information about the course. And um, of course, that makes lots of sense uh, to do that. But I would like to challenge ed educators to think about their course landing page as a place to welcome students, just as you might open your door and welcome someone into your home. So um, you may want to add uh, a diversity and inclusion statement as part of the um, landing page. And you may not have one, but what you can do is do a, an online search and see some different diversity and inclusion, inclusion statements that are out there. I've added one on this slide that you can take a look at as well. But by doing that, um, a student um, sees that page when they go to your course and they see right away that diversity and inclusion is something that's important to you and other students will see that and um, they will it will set the tone for the course and um, make students feel welcomed um, that you actually value um, diversity and enough uh, and uh, inclusion that you've added a statement on the course landing page. Something else to think about is providing links to um, a link to a page with uh, different resources. So for example, if you have first generation students, they may, may need support that is different from other students. And you may want to add a link to perhaps support that exists at the institution that you're teaching at. You may want to add links to local food banks um, because sometimes students are struggling um, with uh, money while they're taking courses. Um, and as well, uh, you could provide a link, for example, to this book um, that can be found uh, on the eCampus Ontario website. Uh, it's called Low Bandwidth Teaching and Learning. So um, as we talked about, uh, as I talked about earlier, a lot, sometimes students and teachers are dealing with um, issues in terms of reliable internet. And this book talks about um, ensuring that um, students can access courses um, easily by uh, learning some tips and tricks about what to do if you have low bandwidth. As well, teachers will learn how to create smaller files so that students um, can access course materials um, easier online. Um, so it's a good uh, link to also provide to students. So um, there's a lot of different things that you could add as part of this welcoming um, page. Um, but what I would suggest is always make sure that it's student centered. And as well, don't be shy about asking your students about what they would like to see on this page. So I've done this before where I will actually survey students and say, what would you like to see on that first page that you land on when you go to the course? And they will let me know. And if it turns out that they would like to see um, assignment deadlines, then that's what I'll add there. But think about things that um, maybe aren't um, uh, related to the course, but may be of importance to ensure that students feel welcome in the course um, for that page. 
So tip number three is including diversity in course materials. I talked a little bit about making, ensuring that everything that you provide in your online course is accessible um, to students who may have um, a slow internet or unreliable internet. Um, but the other part is also ensuring that any sort of images, videos, books, articles that you bring into the course represent um, the diversity found in society. And I will tell you that sometimes finding materials that are diverse will take a bit more effort. Um, so uh, typically where uh, educators are very busy and sometimes we don't have time um, to find the perfect image. Um, so we'll go with whatever comes up first online. But what I'm asking is to take a little bit more time um, to find images that are more diverse so that um, every student in when they're looking at your presentation will see at some point themselves represented in, in that presentation. So I'm going to just show you an example of what I mean that things may, finding an image may take a little bit more time. I'm going to, I've gone to Unsplash. Um, so this is a website where you can grab some um, free photos um, uh, for presentations, um, for backgrounds, uh, for that sort of thing. And I go here for my presentations quite a bit. And when I was teaching a course on child in child and youth studies, um, I was always looking for pictures of families to add in my presentations. And what I discovered is when I would put in the word family, I'd get some pictures of families, but they're um, sort of um, uh, sort of nuclear family um, families that we typically see in ads: uh, mother, father, um, two or three children. Um, so there wasn't a lot of diversity here. But what I found was that if I scrolled a bit further, I would actually find different types of families: so a father and a, and a daughter, um, a mother and her daughter, and um, a lot a lot more diversity in terms of ethnicity and cultural backgrounds and possibly cultural traditions as well. So, but as I said, I have to go and dig a little bit deeper for these images that are more diverse that I could add to my presentations. So that's something I just want you to keep in mind is if you do a Google uh, a search online, don't go with the first image that you find um, because most likely it won't be very diverse. Um, you'll have to dig a little bit deeper to ensure that you find images, videos, and other materials that are more diverse. But uh, as a word of caution, be careful of materials that have stereotypes in them. So you may find something that you feel works well, but it actually may be uh, perpetrating a stereotype or uh, showing a particular group in a negative way, a negative um, manner. So what I would suggest is um, go to reliable um, websites in terms of perhaps organizations uh, uh, and take a look at images that are there and then try to um, find uh, just try to figure out if it's a good image to use or not. And the other option is just to go to someone from that particular um, background who may be able to uh, provide an opinion on the image or the video that you would like to include in your courses. Tip number four is a really important one and not one that we think a lot about sometimes, um, but it's really important to ensure that you invite speakers from diverse backgrounds to your online courses. And now that you're teaching online, you'll probably have opportunities to invite people that you weren't thinking of before because now you can invite people from all around the world. Um, there's also opportunities to record people and then show them in class. But I was talking um, to some media program graduates when I was doing some research about diversity in media and um, student after student um, shared with me what Lily shared with me as well was that a lot of guest speakers would come into the courses um, that she was taking but she never really saw anyone that looked like her. And so she, uh, at the end of the day, when she would um, hear guest speakers speaking, she just felt there wasn't a place for her in the radio industry. And that's where she was thinking she wanted to end up professionally after graduating. Um, so what's really important to ensure when you bring in a guest speaker is to maybe go outside your own networks um, because we tend to go back to the people that we know, that are our friends, that we've worked with, um, and they tend to be the same people that will be guest speakers in our classroom, but they tend to be people who are like us. Um, 
uh, who uh, perhaps have the same background as, as we do. And so what I would suggest is go outside of your own networks to find someone. And that may be a little bit more difficult, but at least um, you will be bringing someone that may not, uh, that may be a little bit more relevant um, to more of the students in your class. The other thing is you could always survey your students and find out who they would like to see in their classroom because a guest speaker is not just only an opportunity to think about, um, to, uh, to find out about a particular profession that they're interested in getting into, but also it's a networking opportunity. So there may be particular people that they would like to meet um, or hear from so that they have a better idea of that, of the industry that they're interested in working in. So that's um, tip number four. And then for my last tip, I would suggest being open to change. Um, so sometimes it's um, very scary to make, uh, to make changes to things that we've been doing for a while. And this is course design that includes course design as well as an educator. It can be really um, disconcerting to think about making changes. Um, but what I'm um, asking is that um, you consider embracing discomfort and consider the possibility of making mistakes as something that is actually good for you. So I was speaking once to an instructor about um, making changes in my own course design and my fears of making mistakes because I didn't understand something very well. And she said that, you know, the best thing I could do is educate myself and as well go ahead with the idea that I had because if I made a mistake, I would learn from it. But if I decided to not make any changes, then nothing would change for my students. And so that is sort of um, information that I've kept very close to my um, to to my heart when I'm actually uh, designing courses and that I go back to that it's important that to make change because it will it it could mean really great things for your students so don't stop um, from making changes uh, because there's that possibility that you may make a mistake or feel uncomfortable um, the other thing is, if there's something that you feel you're lacking in, in terms of learning more about somebody, uh, somebody's particular background, a cultural tradition, um, or something else, some other um, uh, uh, point or factor of diversity that you're not very clear on, um, perhaps read books on it, watch documentaries, speak to people outside of your social circle, and educate yourself in that way. And then the last thing I would like to just share is that um, keep in mind that even if you make small changes to the way you are designing your courses, it can really mean uh, a huge difference in the lives of your students. They will see um, learning um, in your course in a, through in a very different way, and it could have very po a very positive impact on them. So keep that in mind that even small changes can make a really huge difference for your students. So I've reached the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening to it. And um, if you would like to reach out to me, there's my email. Thanks so much.